Welcome to this second short video on saving. In this video, we're going to review what we did in the previous video, uh, where we drew diagrams to represent this choice about how much to consume today in period one versus tomorrow in period two. Uh, and then we're going to think about how the consumer would respond when the interest rate increases. And what we'll find is that, you know, our intuition is probably that if you get more interest, you'd want to save more. But uh, the actual economics of it's a little bit more complicated. If you haven't seen the previous video, I'd go ahead and pause this one and go back to that before returning here. Okay, so as a review, we'll, in, in our model, there's two periods. There's period one, we'll call that today. Period two, we'll call that tomorrow. Uh, we have a choice between how much we consume today versus tomorrow, that's how we get our utility. Um, and as our givens, we're gonna be told a certain, that we have a certain amount of income that we start with in period one, that's $100 here, and there's a certain amount of interest we can earn by saving. If we don't consume our money in period one, then we can save it, earn interest on it, and then we'll be able to consume more in period two. And that's really the essence of the trade-off here. So first we wanna construct our budget constraint. The easy point to get is first on this x-axis, we know that if we consume all of our money today, that would be $100 worth of consumption. So the maximum C1 we could get is $100. And then we can get a second point and connect the dots to get our budget constraint. The second point is on the y-axis, and that's going to be uh, the max we could consume in period two. As we calculated in the previous video, that's basically 1 plus R, where R is in uh, decimal units. So an R of 10% really means R is 0.1. Um, 1 plus R times our income, so that'll be $110 here. And then finally we notice that, and as you can see here, the slope is going to be equal to 1 plus R. There's a, there's a, it's, the slope is not one to one, it's not like if you give up a dollar of consumption in period two, you get a dollar of consumption in period one. The actual trade-off is that in order to get more consumption today, you have to give up one do, one do, to, to get one dollar of consumption today, you have to give up a dollar in the future and the interest you could have had by saving uh, and consuming later on. So the trade-off is not one-to-one, -one. this slope is one plus r. So let's go ahead and draw in an indifference curve and show some optimal bundle here. Uh, let's say that the optimum is right here. We'll say that it's where you, where you consume, say, $60 in period one. And then you can see here implicitly on the diagram our savings, if we're consuming $60 in period one, then we must be saving uh, $40 because 100 minus our consumption in period one gives us our savings. And then if we save $40, we'll be able to consume that $40 in the next period plus the interest income, which will be 10 times, 10% of the savings, or $4. So our optimal point is 60, 44. And now what we wanna do is think about what would, how would we respond, or how would the consumer respond if the interest rate goes up? And let's suppose interest goes up uh, a lot, rises significantly, it rises to, I don't know, you know, 100%. So if you save your money, it'll, it'll double and you'll be able to consume twice as much as you save. In that case, we'll get a new budget constraint. This point won't change. We'll still be able to consume $100 maximum in period one, but if we save, we'll be able to consume our $100 we saved plus the interest income, which is 100% of our savings, so we'll be able to consume $200. So this budget constraint will get a lot steeper. Uh, and now if I extend this indifference curve, what we're basically going to see, let me extend, oh no. What we're basically going to see is that it looks like there's a lot of points on this new budget constraint that are better than our original point. We have points up here where we'd be consuming less in period one and a lot more in period two. We have points like here where we consume more in both. We even have points over here that are, the it's theoretically possible that a point down here where you consume more in period one and less in period two uh, could be better. Although it turns out we're gonna assume that these are normal goods, so you would never do that. And the way we can see kind of our analysis of 
overall what we'd expect to happen is with our standard tool of income substitution and uh, total effect tables. So we'll do that over here, filling it in. All right, so our starting point is we can fill out our substitution effects without really knowing anything about whether the goods are normal or inferior or whatever. We know that as the interest rate goes up, it effectively makes it more expensive to consume today. Because if you want to get that dollar today, you have to give up a dollar tomorrow and the interest you could have earned. And now that interest you're giving up is even bigger than before. So our substitution is going to be towards consumption in period two and away from consumption in period one. Uh, then we can think about the income effects. Clearly, if interest is if the interest rate goes up, it effectively makes you richer. You know, we used to have this as our budget constraint. Now we have this as our budget constraint. It's opened up a lot of new possibilities in here, so uh, we're richer. And what we're going to do is assume both of these are normal goods. You know, it makes sense that general purpose consumption of goods should increase when your income increases, regardless of whether it's today or tomorrow. So if both are normal goods and our income is increasing, these income effects are going to be positive for both. And that lets us conclude that consumption in period two is definitely going to increase, which is something I mentioned earlier. But the effect on C1 is ambiguous. That's a little surprising uh, because we can add a third column here about savings, how much we save, and we know that there's a one-to-one -one trade off between consumption in period one and savings. If consumption in period one goes up, that means there's less money we have to save, so our savings goes down. So if the income effect is positive on consumption in period one, it's negative on savings. And similarly, if consumption in period one goes down because of the substitution effect, then we're saving more because of the substitution effect. And our conclusion is that because of competing substitution and income effects, Saving could really go up or down as the interest rate rises. It really depends on which one is dominant. Our intuition is probably that the substitution effect is going to dominate. If I offered you 100% interest, uh, if you saved at my bank, you'd probably want to save a lot of money there. But theoretically, there's some ambiguity. And the last thing I want to point out is that if you look at this diagram and you look at this substitution and income effects and total effects table, um, it it probably looks very, very, very familiar. And that's because in terms of the mathematics and the economic intuition, this model is basically identical to our labor leisure trade-off model. Uh, whether it's the wage going up, making you richer and wanting to you know, substitute towards working more, or it's the interest rate going up and making you richer and making you want to substitute towards saving more, there's competing income and substitution effects, which leads to competing kind of tendency towards whether you supply more labor or save more money. So hopefully you see the connection. If not, there is a three-part series on labor supply that you can watch in a uh, related playlist on this channel. All right, so in our third video, we're going to go ahead and plot the supply of savings, reading these, getting some practice reading these diagrams, so I hope to see you there.